I approach this issue is that I read the Genesis story and I see that God created man to be in his image and a priest on earth in a garden. And he was given a commission to dominate the land, but to cultivate it, to tend to it, not to destroy it, not to uh, pillage and to rape the land that God had given him. And it is part of the redemptive act of Christ that human beings should find a harmony with nature. And that's the kind of argument the patriarch Constantinople, yeah, Bartholomew yeah. of Constantinople yeah. pushes forward. He goes to the Genesis story and he sees the destruction of the environment as an expression of the fall of man. That, that's, that's how I get there, yeah. you know. What are your thoughts? Exactly, the only thing I disagree with that is um, we are not, we don't dominate the land. Yeah. We, we are the land, we are part of, we're no different to, we're made up of everything, we are stardust. Yeah. Everything, everything we're made of is from stars that exploded found millions of years, billions of years ago. Totally agree with you. Um, yeah, and we are part of this, we're not separate to any of the other, the animals in, this, in, in life on this planet, we're all part of the same cycle. And this theory that is understanding we can save the planet, no, we can't, it depends on whether the planet can save us. Yeah. You know, we have, we've come to the point now, okay, humanity is going to go off the end of the cliff, because that's the way nature intends it to happen. Now, how we, in what guise and how we go over the end of the cliff is down to us now. Yeah. We have now run out of time. Uh, yeah, it I, is now, you know, there's no arguing. Look what's happening in Japan this very moment now. Two million people are now being told to evacuate for the rain. You know, two look, million? Two million. Wow. Yeah. Look what's gone in Turkey. Yeah. Yeah, now the floods now from the fires. Yeah. Europe, across from North America, California. Yep. It's... Yeah. You know, this is not, you know, this is not just... Uh, it's not, being staged. <laughs> it's not being staged. It's not There's being no staged. There's no conspiracy. It's really happening. Yeah. I agree with you. I think, I think the line that we were not meant to cross was a line decades ago. Absolutely. And I actually think that the scientists and the politicians who are saying, oh, we've got 10 years left or 20 years left, are either in denial or they are actually deceiving themselves or they're consciously deceiving us. That, that, that we're, it's not that we're not facing a cataclysm. The question is, what level of cataclysm are we facing? And I think, and it's interesting, there's two things that you said that I, I want to touch on from scripture. You said that we were stardust. Genesis says that we're made from the dust of the earth. So, so you know, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Genesis story has these parallels to truth that we pick up on in nature that yeah. testifies and witnesses to its divine origin. But you also talked about how we're, we're approaching a cataclysm. And the weird thing is, if you read the story of Christ's return, it talks about a world that has technology far, far redacted and reduced from where we're at now. Now, I always assumed and thought that that was because it was written in the past, so it just spoke about the environment that it was in. But now, considering the cataclysm that's barreling down the road at us, that we're not going to escape, and knowing what cataclysms do to societies, how they push it technologically backwards, I'm now starting to rethink the way I'm reading the Return of Christ stories. As in, it's in the future, but the society that Christ returns to is a much more reduced, a much more broken society, precisely because the juggernaut that's going to hit us head on. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on that? I totally agree. Um, I mean, it's, it's mine, I used to use this analogy quite a bit here sometimes. We've got. We've got one you talk to the we've, mic, we'll pick up your voice. We've got, we've got Christians arguing with Muslims uh, and other groups, and everybody's shouting this about their, who their truth is. And, then, and as everybody's shouting, the water is rising, and they're still shouting. And yeah. There's got to be a point when we get to the water here, we've got to start uh, talking and thinking, coming together, and making a boat. We've got to get, get out of this mess. And this is what I was talking about earlier on. We've got, we've got to find a time now about, it's about understanding and finding some tolerance and some middle ground because we have to. We've got to start coming together, all coming together around the planet. Otherwise, I, right. I think I think that the the question of the environment needs to be taken out of every other political argument. Because the thing is, if the left, who are the main pushers of the environmental question, connect this issue to abortion and euthanasia and the transformation of marriage, I'm going to oppose them. Connecting it to other political issues 
is going to create resistance that we can't afford. So I beg, I beg every environmentalist to not connect this issue to any other political issue. Because if you do, I and lots of other Christians will end up fighting you on it. Mm -hmm. And lots of other conservatives will fight you on it. And we can't afford that kind of fight. We don't have the time. We've all got to see the importance of this issue and disconnect it to every other agenda and just deal with it as a unique cause, completely in isolation to everything else. And, and I don't know where you are on the political spectrum. but if I you, Yeah, I don't uh, follow any politics. Fine. But if you do speak to environmentalists on the left, please preach to them that they mustn't connect it to other politics. Because if they connect it to abortion or euthanasia, I will resist their movement. And that is not, and I'm your ally on the question of the environment. Mm. So you don't, we can't afford that friction. We can't afford that resistance. And it's interesting that I think in the Bible, the Bible gives us some of the answers that we need. The Bible talks about the great judgment in Noah's time, the flood of the earth. Mm -hmm. And God gathered everything, the animals, two by two, into the ark. And I think that that's prophetic. That's what we need now. We need to create purposefully arcs of biodiversity yep. to preserve the planet yep. to 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 rebuild and to repopulate yep. the earth after the coming judgment it's almost like the story of noah was given to us as a solution to the problem that we're facing now what are your thoughts on that absolutely i mean the arcs i mean it's like it's like forests you know arcs for biodiversity again yeah it's not just about planting trees we don't want lots and lots of pine trees yeah we need forests we need yes. large woodlands and these again these are the arcs that we need to get around the country around the world yeah absolutely i mean they've they've building one in greenland or in iceland an arc of of seeds yeah you know under the ground yeah 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 because yeah, because basically whilst they're telling us that there's still time they're preparing for something far far worse and i think I think that if people would take the theology of the Christian faith seriously, not only would they see some of the answers, but they would also find the values that are needed to address this. And I, I, I speak openly, I, I, challenge, I challenge my own brothers and sisters to research environmentalist theologies. Being pro-environment is not against scripture. When the Bible talks about dominion, it has this idea of caretaker, this idea of responsibility, not this idea of trashing and ruining, but like a gardener, yeah. you know? I, I, for me personally, I think one of the key things that we can do is basically reforest Europe. It's one thing to lecture the rest of the world in Brazil about not cutting down trees when they're desperately poor. If we're going to ask them not to do that, we should pay them. But we should, if we're going to say to them, don't deforest, it strikes me that what we should be doing in Europe is reforesting and creating massive forests across Europe. And, and we look at, need to look at the reason why it's being deforested and what they're using it for. So it's for animal feeds, yep. and it's for soya and it's for palm oil. Yep. Do you remember, it's probably before your time, you used to go to Boots, you go to Boots to get a prescription or your hot water bottle or a couple of other bits. Yep. You go in there now, you've got every kind of uh, wash, um, um, shampoo, conditioner, makeup. Yep. All that rubbish, we don't need any of it. Yep. And it's the same with all our food stuff. We wonder why there's a huge obesity crisis. Yep. And then they'll say, oh, but people are living longer. Yes, the generation that were born in the 50s, they're living longer. But the, gener the young generation now, the millennials, so that, that window, they ain't going to live long. Yeah. Capitalism has peaked. Yeah. And it's all through that kind of diet again. So you're going to see in 20 Talk to years, mind. you are going to see a huge drop in the population. Now, is that a good thing for the planet? But in that time, from now until then, is that constant ravage of the planet for soy, for corn, for all these foodstuffs, which most of it is actually going into animal feed for the unnecessary uh, production of beef and other meatstuffs around the world. Yeah. So, again, it's down to society. It's got really, it's got really got to turn their mindset. It's got to be a voluntary change on simplicity. Yeah. Governments have got their part, but we, the consumer, have got to make the change. Yes. That's that. That fundamentally is is the, the real crux of it. You know, look, look at Christmas for example. Imagine if uh, this year we decide, okay. We're going to cancel Christmas by buying presents around the world. Can you imagine the change that will make to the planet? Yep. 
totally. I mean, the thing is, buying buying presents is a, a tradition within the church, but that that is not something that's essential to our faith. You know, we don't need Christmas lights, we don't need plastic Christmas trees, we don't even need Christmas presents. You know, lots of Christians give money, but but why not just do something thoughtful, like cook someone a meal, spend time with them, you know, write them a letter on recycled paper, telling them how much you love them, telling them how much they transformed your life. That's going to be much more heartfelt than buying them some plastic made in China. Yeah, running out of Christmas Eve, what can I get them? I'll buy them this, buy them this. Now, I, yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna confess that I still have some way to go on this. I go along with the consumer culture at Christmas. I buy Christmas presents. And, and this is something that I need to improve upon. And what's really interesting about the Christian faith is that it has the ability to, to morph and to change according to the circumstances. So before we understood, for instance, that you know, we had these under understandings of the environment and our impact on the environment. It's fair to say Christians were not doing anything wrong by being consumerists. To a degree, obviously, there's a limit by what I mean by this. But going along with buying and, and giving and that kind of thing. But as we've come to understand the impact that we're having on the environment, the Christian faith allows the conscience, because now it's about the conscience being informed by new information, our impact on the environment, it allows us to apply our values, which have remained the same and are unchanged, in a new way. We're still called to have dominion over the earth. But if we recognize that we have dominion over the earth and by certain actions we're destroying it, we're failing to have the kind of dominion that the Bible is talking about, and so we can change the action. Because is, you know, Christianity is not like Islam that has a one rule fits all attitude. It has a principle of working out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus in terms of your interaction with the environment? And that means to be God's priest on earth. And that means to honor that which God has given you governance over because he is the possessor of the land, not you. It's his, not yours. So you don't have the right to destroy it because he's going to ask you, what did you do with the things I gave you? Mm. And if your answer this is, is God's church. Exactly. That, that's exactly the Garden of Eden story, yeah. Steve. The, 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 the Garden of Eden is the temple of the Mosaic Covenant. That's how it was meant to be. This natural world was meant to be the temple in which humans worship God. But we turned away from all of that, turned to ourselves, and then screwed everything up and have been screwing everything up for 10,000 years. Which is exactly why we need Jesus. <laughs> to point us back in the right direction. But I, I, go on, what's your thoughts on that? I, I think, I mean, we're both on the same track. You know, we're, 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 we're two lines of the same railway track. Yeah. You know, um, I, from the Druid's perspective, we don't, we, don't, we don't look to see we need the Jesus figure to do it, because we are, we have to make that decision ourselves. We, we, we need to reconnect to the land and to the environment. Um, not have the crutch of having Jesus or the Bible to fall back on. Yeah. Um, the thing is, and this will be a debate for another time, the paganism that you're talking about, the druidism that you're talking about, has no connection to the historical Judaism. And I would argue that if you look at any, every evidence that we have of the ancient Druids, they didn't really care about the environment in the way that modern Druids do. That's right, yeah. You know, um, whereas in the Bible, properly understood, there is this theology that was there all the time, that has now come to the fore because of the concerns that we're meeting. I'm gonna end on a sad note though, because for me personally, I've slowly come to the conclusion that I see the four riders of the apocalypse lining up on the hills. I see them in the distance. Famine, war, disease, and pestilence. No, and death. <laughs> death. Seriously, I look at the situation we're in right now, and as much as I would think that we can turn it around, human beings are not the kind of creatures that change quickly. The environment is gonna to go to pot. That is gonna create wars. That is gonna create famine. And then you've got disease and you've got death. And that is exactly what the Bible says sadly is going to happen. I don't think it has to happen that way. I think the Bible gives us two possible futures. But sadly, I think we're tunneling down 
one of the options that's the least best. You know, but Christ is there pointing in the other direction the whole time. I'm going to end on a positive note. Go on then. In Druidry, everything works in a circle. Things naturally break, things regrow, reborn and fix. It's almost like that Japanese uh, arch when they, they mend pots, they glue them back together, that they use gold. Yeah. Yeah, so you get this beautiful pot, but there's always that gold-silver lining. So in yes, things are going to get pretty horrible. But at the end of the... Not in our time, but the Earth, part of, you know, which is part of the universe, things are going to work out. <laughs> I hope you're right. We would because that because that is that is the law of nature. Well, mm, you, you run away greens now. Gases in Mercury, like there is there are models of environmentalism that talk about runaway um, greenhouse gas feedback loops that lead to essentially Earth becoming like Mercury. Well, in the next about billion years, the sun, our sun's going to well, expand yes. and we're going to get swallowed up. Well, anyway. the, the, and, and the Bible, the Bible teaches it. The Bible says that the stars will melt away. That's what it says in scripture, that the, the, the heavenly powers will be shaken, the stars yeah. will be swept from the skies, yeah. and that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Yeah. And ultimately, that is the hope that we Christians look to. Not salvation in this world, but salvation in the next. Doesn't mean that we can abuse this world, no. but it means that our ultimate hope is in the afterlife, not in this one. Lovely talking to you, Steve. Oh, now you lovely. owe me, you owe me to let you buy you a drink. Do. Yeah, fantastic. Great talking. Where's JC gone? He always walks away, and then I'm left with a camera. <laughs> I'll be two minutes, I'll find him no, so we can pack just got to do goodbyes. Okay, then, uh, you... are you going to come back on a more regular basis? I'm going to try and come down once a month. Brilliant. We'll, have, we'll do that Druid Christianity debate. Yeah, yeah, because we've, um, we've got many Christian Druids. That's an interesting one. Let's yeah, talk about many, that. Yeah, many, and we, there's, there's a wonderful uh, Druid church in Brittany we go to. It's been there for two or three years. That worships years. Christ? Yes. You're going to have to tell me about yeah. that one. Maybe even bring one down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Celtic Druid, uh, Christian base. It's, it's, very, it's a very strong vein. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. You know, because, you know, it's, it's said that Joseph of Arimathea came to, uh, with Jesus to Glastonbury. Yes, that, there is yeah, that tale. Yeah, on this. Yeah, I don't believe that. We don't believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, we can be pretty sure he didn't. <laughs> like, he was a carpenter, Joseph of Arimathea. He wouldn't have needed to travel. Joseph Arimathea. Uh, wait, no, Joseph, Joseph Arimathea. No, that Jesus uncle. Ah, are we? No, anyway, we'll talk about that. We'll yeah. talk about that another time. Yeah. Anyway, God bless you, yeah. Steve. I'm going to take you away. So say your goodbyes. Let me get JC.